Continuing education knows that at the end, students want to graduate, and we can help them do that because we take the time to really listen to their needs, and we understand all the different options that are available across the campus for them. We don't take a cookie cutter approach. We realize each student comes with their own story. So whether it's a part-time student looking to complete a degree program or someone just looking for online courses, we're there to connect them to the resources of the university. Uh, my name is Ron Bostwick. I'm a longtime moderator at the Conference on World Affairs and also, some of you may know, evening show host at the Colorado Sound radio station. Today is Friday, April 14th at 10.30 a.m. and this is the panel Ode to Earth, Sky, and Ocean. Not Earth, Wind, and Fire. That's a whole nother panel that we'll do later on. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that Boulder is on the ancestral homelands of the unceded territory of indigenous peoples who have traversed, lived in, and stewarded lands in the Boulder Valley since time immemorial. Those indigenous nations include the Apache, Arapaho, Cheyenne, Comanche, Pawnee, Shoshone, Sioux, and Ute. One other thing I want to mention is that we want to be sure to give you, the audience, a chance to ask questions today. And here's how we're going to handle the Q&A. We'll reserve the end of the discussion for that Q&A. We're going to be using a note card system to receive questions from you, the audience. Now, at any time in the session, at any time during the session, just raise your hand to request a note card, and one of our producers over here on the uh, wall will come over and hand you a pencil and a uh, note card, and we ask you to just write down your question. We ask you to write legibly, so I can make sure that I uh, present your question correctly. If you're a student, please note this on the uh, question on your card. And when you finish, just raise your hand again. Our producers will come over and bring the card over to me. And uh, I ask you all to make your questions brief and to the point, if you would. Our uh, panelist who is here with us today uh, covers some ground, I think, that uh, touches on all of us. I think all working people have various fantasies uh, about their job. Uh, one of them, in a stereotypical way, is to get to travel, write about it, and get paid. <laughs> and. Another fantasy is to be able to eat, write about it, and get paid. <laughs> Our panelist today is fulfilling both of those fantasies for us. Uh, words and writing about them have been very important to her. She's been a contributing editor, an executive editor, a blogger, an author, and a poet. 
Her work has been wrapped around sustainability issues, and with our theme at the Conference on World Affairs being climate, that work brings her, for her first time, to the Conference on World Affairs. Uh, would you please welcome to Boulder, Betsy Andrews. So our plan is for Betsy to just talk for a little bit about the topic of this panel. Uh, part of what the conference is about is having panel titles that are open to interpretation, whether by the audience or by the panelists. So we'll have uh, Betsy just sort of talk for a little bit. She's going to read from some of her poetry also, and then we'll come to the audience for Q&A. All yours. Thank you. Hey, guys. Thanks for being here today. Um, so another uh, fantasy I hope that you all have is to uh, make art, and that's what I get to do as a poet, um, although I do travel and eat for a living. I'm going to read from, my, from the first three in a quartet of books that I'm writing. So I write in uh, a tradition called echo-poetics, and echo-poetics you know, is not just using nature as a metaphor, but is about nature, and specifically is about nature in the Anthropocene, and about human beings, uh, sometimes beautiful and oftentimes traumatic uh, relationship and treatment of nature. Um, so these four books are a quartet uh, loosely based on the elements. So the first book I wrote was New Jersey. That's this book, which I, and I'll read from all three of these books. So New Jersey, was an anti-war meditation on the New Jersey Turnpike that I wrote after September 11th. Uh, I live in New York. My family lives in Philadelphia. I spend a lot of time on that road. It is the most traveled road in the United States. It's about fossil fuels. And uh, I think that's what the war in Iraq was about. Um, and so, you know, this kind of, combines my anti-war sentiments, the news of the day, and my experiences of traveling that turnpike. There is a uh, building off that turnpike that you, you drive, sort of you're driving through kind of farmland, and then you see this building rising up out of cornfield that says Naval Combat Systems Engineering. Very big letters on the side of it, which was the sort of germ of this book, because I was like, what is that? Turns out they, um, it, they build parts for uh, battleships there. Um, so I'm gonna start with New Jersey and then we'll go on from there. And we can talk about my process of writing afterwards. Um, I'm gonna wear my glasses because I'm not getting any younger. Oh, I also want to say that this reading is, this, this, this uh, reading is rated uh, PG-13 for strong language, reference to violence, and a little bit of sex. Prowling down the ration line in a state of poachers and hares, I wrote a note in pencil, and the turnpike man, a venturous fairy, promised to send it to you. It was the fetching of nuts, a staged comeback, the highly discomforting whisper of stars, the exhalation of nativity figures, a sordid drama new from the razor, the smart highways, thousand sensors altogether new, a new classification of birds and fishes, new potatoes dug anew, the sluices, wharfs, wares, weirs, bucks, winches, dams, sasses, floodgates wide open through. It was gutter cleaning, a complaint, a jest, an intolerable grievance loaded beyond the law. The new ice around us in thaw, the floating ice, frazzle ice, grease ice, pancake ice. It was of a specific gravity, winding like a snail cap up lee shores and frightful cliffs, words falling out like fillings, space like the space between thighs, an enormous moment and a tiny thing. It was fact-related, the official said, a hove dance, a caroling. It was Cake's Child, Cake's, composed entirely of zippers, the sexed-up world's simple machine, a low, bedeviling hum on a tarmac that only some of us hear, something no one writes about unless they weren't there. 
Minuscule, heartbreaking, infant parts, sentences, sex, surveillance planes, a jackboot in the mouth, a family travel guide littered with filth, a snake who spits up a snoring dog, a bed creaking and creaking and creaking in a crawl space behind the sheetrock, the text on a child's shopping bag, if your heart is as kind as your young eyes now, you are my love. Hot rods and guitars, surfers and ravens, evergreens, entrails and radio, Girls in ranch house living rooms, fraying like patchwork quilts. Where symbols, of course, are extremely important, turns and nooks, mazes and hooks, the mouth wizardry of public pronouncements like, we really hammered the place. Major Darren Wright, 1st Battalion, 8th Infantry, 4th Inf Infantry Division, United States Army, Iraq. Soldiers wearing night vision goggles, pouring in, rifles at ready, streaming into bedrooms. Women and children hoarded into, herded into one room, men into another. The raid turns up nothing but a few World War II era rifles, a sheath of paper. The lieutenant, a West Point graduate, pulls a wad of bills from his pocket, peels off 120 bucks, hands it to one of the dazed men who signs a receipt for the reparations, and the soldiers troop back out. While the cars in front of me move like gloved hands, humping along on haunches, on little devil paws, I open my umbrella to the problem of the toll plaza, electric lines, highway signs, overpass, guardrail, lamp standard, bridge structure, interchange, traffic advisory radio signals, microwave towers, state police we know as police for their blue and and white cars which read police. From northern meadowlands to southern farmlands, soybeans, peaches, eggplants, onions, peppers, beans, asparagus, apples, cranberries, blueberries, strawberries, corn, New Jersey's 800 million tomatoes, poison insects, tiny bombs, fields of chemical shit. Naval combat systems engineering rising from the toxic dung. Small scrap of lover on the dirty car floor. Old dog in the back seat minding her old tricks. Reports that nothing has happened yet. Not screaming old ladies, motorized carts, luggage left on carousels, babies crawling on glass. Crisps of curl off wild wind swirl. At the lady poet's potluck, the endearing father figure tapes a poem to my face. Like a captive forced to march the streets holding my bars in front of me, I troop to the groaning board where the drunken friend takes a bite of the thing, spits it out, transformed. At the Swedesboro exit, at the Woodbury exit, at the Camden exit, at the Burlington exit, hometown thespians rehearse a musical adaptation of War Games the dead-eye indicator of the devil undazzled in the details. A bus of party delegates slouching in their friction-charged skins rolls past the jobbing line, rolls past the meat-packing plant toward the birth of a new convulsive nature, a countrywide husbandry, an emotional swing, the dream of the dream of the dream of a driver seated and commandeering down the gaping streets of retractable housing where the aluminum siding licks its own wounds and and a four-year-old in the driveway repeats to herself, you're okay, you're okay. It's a glimpse of space through an eight-foot straw, the assisted revival of a deadly disease, extended combat deployment for dolphins, a bird that nests in a chainsaw tree, dancing for a mate in the dust. On a sky built of squares in a city emptied of contents, someone's dinner on the freezing concrete, gravy like hunks of glass. The dog kidnaps thoughts off my plate, ugly food, poorly plated, taking the middle of America by storm. James Fenimore Cooper, the last of the Mohicans, Popeyes, and an ATM. 
Joyce Kilmer, Trees and Other Poems, Nathan's and an ATM. Context in which a lavatory. Context in which nighttime fixins, bar, technician, the unretiree. Car parking, truck parking, bus parking poured upon oak, birch, beech, maple, hemlock, dogwood, white cedar, pine. Upon white-tailed deer, upon fox, upon squirrel, upon chipmunk, upon bear, a few fewer bear. Upon woodchuck, possum, rattlesnake, skunk, upon Jersey blue, that fat mongrel fowl, various performance enhancing ingredient additives locked into a mass, poured over limestone, sandstone, gneiss, schist, shale, granite, marble, slate, basalt. Above it all, heaven, a military gain. Beneath it all, a map on the wall, a label that reads our world, a presidential plutonian suite upholstered in brawling warrior swagger swatchers of aggressively hot pink, like the poem I found in the State of the Union. Terror, terrorist, terrorists, 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 terror, terrorism, terrorists, terrorists, terrified, terror, terrorist. The takeover boys, the property boys, I mean, these people are serious. And I am hoggishly, wolfishly, piggishly, doggedly, harebrained. Hegelian, schooled, of course, but love storms my middle-aged lips. In the new moon, the new old solution, the bleachers like bellows breathing with the breath of the breathing people, light thrown off in all directions. It's enough to give one goose flesh, or else wrap tissue around the tabloids. That way, the news won't rub off on you. So that's New Jersey. Um, the second book I wrote is called The Bottom. This was the water book. By the way, my mother just FaceTimed me. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mom. I hope you're watching. Um, and I'm a scuba diver. I've been scuba diving for 45 years. I've watched the oceans change a lot. Um, so this book is my ode to the ocean, and I'll sing a little bit. Atop the bottom, the water ghost, the riddle ghost tower, fireballs lapping the ghost map, the ghost nets, the ghost moon, the ghost lines, the ghost traps, fingerlings giving up ghost, the long dark drive, the ghost drive over the derelict moat, the ghost era's ghost dish, its secrets, its swallows, its test sites, thousand ghost bites named for rivers and ice caps and nautical terms for fish and for towns named for ghost. The long gone ghost of the beaver meadow, Las Vegas they called it skinned, ghost wagers streaming in. The once and again wealth of the nation a tour tram parking lot coast. Ghost of the barnacled schoolroom, lesson a nibbling ghost. In the hook and sink daybreak at the school black ghost black terminal, its scaffolds and catwalks and ladders and berths, gunships, its ghost and ghost host. A born again freighter named Universal Hope is suckling, is guzzling up the ghost. In the cold commons ghost mouth, a trio of pearls, three inches, enraptured by ghost. The narwhal, the sea cow, the sea mink, the monk seal, a mouthful of ghost word extinct. The half seas coral, a ghost story written in bone white ink. The king counts his ghost lands, his wrecks, and his floatsome, his jetsome, his water strays, his fishes. My wishes, we are on the shore. We are looking out at the water. You are lying beside me, curled. The sun is coming up. 
I am, the sun is coming up. I am turning you over. I am going to see your face. The sun is coming up. I am turning you over. I am going to be able to see your face. The women who follow the herring shoals, the women who walk the coast, at eight pence an hour, the harbor host to a thousand smacks of the ocean's envy, the dogfish, the cachalot, the thresher, the mink, Bitten by a dog um, on a mile-long chain, the hewers spelling again and again the end of another vicious enrapture. F roll fingers in sacks of vacant flour, take knives to the belly of that they call darling. It's a job. And the word grown up from the scaries and docks speaks leagues of our need to clock taking in order to live. Darling, the bottom is thoroughly touched. It is tractored and train tracked and flood lit with grid, the remains of a scuttled crab pot, its lid long tossed to the porpoise show public, where the prince of humbugs counts his receipts, hammering jumbo with rot gut. There was mystery the mock turtle sighs. There was drawing and fainting and stretching in coils until the water froze and the fireman's hose, the seals flopping out on the downtown cobble, the whales boiled in their tanks. It stank for days of dead giant. It's pliant, the bottom. It can be caned and rushed and scraped from the cask and torn from the wig and shorn from the wig and tilled and tooled and authored. But its black blues are the black blues of nowhere on surface, and we have better relations with Mars. To get to the bottom of this fishy deal, we'll have to walk the plank, sink us down with a long, long roll, where the sharks will have our bodies and the devil have our souls. With the hagfish and snot worms and cutthroat eels, we'll pull bottom wool off sailors' bones to make our sodden meals. Oh, a mermaid's life is full of strife with men of ease and business. From our heads to our waists, we're just their taste, and after that, we're fishes. 1830, farmers cutting seaweed to spread on their potato fields spy a creature thrashing in the water. A boy hits her on the head with a rock and she dies. Watched ashore, she is the length of a four-year-old with an outsized chest and a lower half that looks like a salmon without scales. The factor of Ben Bakula orders a coffin and buries her on the shores of Culla Bay. 1717, Dutch sailors catch a creature off the shore of, of the coast of bon Borneo. She cries the cries of a little mouse and shits the shit of kittens. They keep her in a barrel for four days and seven hours and she dies. The Tsar of Russia, Peter the Great, is so moved by a picture of the creature in a book that he travels in disguise across Europe to Amsterdam to press the publisher for further proof. 1620, Charged with securing a colony for the venture capitalist Sir William Vaughan, Captain Richard Whitburn sails to newfound land where a beauteous creature with hair of blue swims up to his boat. A crewman smacks her in the head with an oar and she sinks into the sea. At the bottom of a sea, a whale fall feeds a world. Mucus eels and giant clams and speaker sharks and sleeper sharks and you and me if we sink into that lonely, lonesome water, if we sink into that lonesome sea. To sound like itself is what water wants. To look like itself, to feel wet. Walloped by cinder block spars and bottles, the wanting locked water laid down. The wanting locked water laid down its luster, it laid down its luster and stank. The wanting lock water stank without luster, it stank without luster, and we cut it with knives. We cut it with sister, scissors, the wanting locked water. We cut it with radars, we ginned it. The wanting locked water was ginned and engined, we engined and cinch lipped and quicksilvered water. The water was baited with nixies and boggles, it was looted of moon, it was piss and spit crooked. The water engaged in protective reactions, it limped, it wore bright orange pants. The wanting locked water was orange with panting, was orange and panting and stank. I want a clean cup, interrupts, interrupts the hatter. 
Let's all move one place on. One place on, the octopus burrows into the crevice of the duotex blow-up boat. By the recessed valve between the self-bailing floor and the thermo-bonded buoyancy tube, the octopus burrowed, slender and orange, the wonderpus burrowed, thinking, this is coral, this is rock crack, it's shells. It's slot box eyes clanging like bells on hillocks, it's ginger arms stroking. The sun beat down, the stories were told of the last, of the last, of the last Martian race with bodies like mazes and three beating hearts. The day went on day, the sun turned away, the octopus turned a duotex gray, and finally, from the captain's fingers it slipped dipping its quill in a damning pot and scribbling rage at the lot of us on the illuminated page of the ocean. Fuck you in the name of the tide pools and shrimp haunts. To eat is what the octopus wants. Its excited beak, its gifted locomotion. What the octopus wants is to live. The mermaids raise their hands. They would like to ask a question. They are unfamiliar with microphones and the flotational devices of the press pool, but they recognize a wave when they see one. They can mimic the speed of sound in air. When called on, the mermaids manage their mouths into the shape of, what is that? It's a riddle twice as inflated as Texas. It's six times the weight of the plankton seas. It's a teaser rendered in styrene with the acronym PCB. It's albatross innards decoded as omen. It's a starfish cross plea. It's a whopper, and the flack leaves the bait on the hook. The mermaids listen up. Audible distortions and the deafening roar of no comment, which the mermaids jot in their books. But even if the stowaways are thrown to the squids, the Commodores can't keep a lid on the story. It's leaked in the driftwood, in the rookery, in the dory, in the belly of the catch. The coda is, it's trash. It's sorrow dogs chew toy and worse. It's the skeleton ship's cargo. It's clamshell desires and 70 brands of thirst. Water bottles everywhere, far, far too much to drink. April 17, 2007, following Krill on the heels of the gulls said to be the souls of dead sailors. A tiny mink whale, 5,000 pounds, 212, um, 12 feet long, and at one year old, a baby, enters the mouth of the Gowanus Canal, a Brooklyn waterway which through the years has hosted grist mills, tanneries, stone yards, coal yards, gas plants, cement works, paint factories, ink factories, soap factories, machine shops, sulfur plants, chemical works, and rafts of raw sewage. Lead, oil, mercury, cyanide, asbestos, v VOCs, SVOCs, cholera, typhoid, typhus, and gonorrhea. The sludge at its bottom is dubbed black mayonnaise. It is a day past the day that 32 people are shot and killed at Virginia Tech. The mink whale attracts onlookers hoping for a better news. But the mink whale disappoints. She swims for two days, she splashes, she hits the dock, and she dies. Her pale underside is streaked with blood. She is known to the cops and the Coast Guard officials as NY3673-07. But the onlookers name her Sludgy. In the days past her death, we will sew sludgy pillows and crochet ourselves small sludgy dolls. 34 million years ago, four-legged creatures lost their hind limbs, deer-like, no larger than cashmere sweaters. These are the ancestors of whales. I will cling to you like a muscle, my love. Will you cling to me like a muscle? We'll abide astride this dumb rock together, scarred and thin-shelled and sometimes blue, but nevertheless hanging on. Mermaids, oh, sing your disavowed songs. Bend your human limbs to their business. 
with the pelicans and puffins and gulls and muirs and elegant turns as your witness unloose the harbor seal lassoed with scratch unloose his soft neck and his flippers unloose his fat middle his polka dot cloak unloose his wet eyes and his whiskers spill the wind all over this trammel mouth world spill the seas up onto their beaches i want the sun to come out i want to sail us home the mermaid sang i want the sun to come out I want to sail us home. It's a planet made of ink on the arm of a sailor tricking in the head where the slim wrist of morning is cuffed to the sink to the bottom. The sea dogs foul, howl foul weather at the skies. Where's the sea dogs rise? There must be a kind of day for every dog has one. There must be some bed where sleeping dogs lie and wake up without fleas. When we've managed to pirate every molecule of the seas and replace them with replicas rendered in plastic, there, where the tail wags the sea dog something fantastic, will they witness our bathtub ring finish from space? The face, if it's face, turns to the observable. A pearl of blue, a dusky scratch, a naked singularity cast in a font ten million years gone, still the unmistakable signature of the presence of absence. Past the moon named egg and the moon named egg shell, a crack in the well of the night, hydromantic and perhaps just bright enough for you to find us. Humble telescope, find us. And I'm just going to read a few pages of Crowded to give a little bit of time for questions. What time do we finish? Oh, OK. I got a little bit of time. All right. So this is the latest book, Crowded. This is the air book. Um, it's called Crowded because it's crowded up there. There's a lot of stuff up there, right? Uh, um, Planes and drones and particulate matter sort of jostling the birds and the bees and the bats and uh, the souls of the dead. So when I started writing this book, um, which was during the Trump administration, so you uh, and you'll you'll recognize the president when I get to him. Um, my father died, and my father was a complicated and difficult guy. His life was shaped by the, uh, by the traumas of the 20th century, um, fossil fuel extraction and, uh, and war. He, uh, his, his father was a coal miner who died of black lung disease. Um, it was a hard scrabble like life. There was a lot of alcoholism. Uh, my father went, uh, was uh, drafted into the war, into the Korean War. Uh, and he was uh, shot up in Korea, and he had shrapnel uh, in his body that used to fall out in the shower. It was these hard little blue-black bits of it in his skin. And uh, he was in the oil and gas industry. He reconditioned uh, steel drums um, for, for oil. So, um, yeah, his life was all involved in that. Uh, so the uh, Jungian therapists will tell you that when somebody dies, the object is gone, but the image remains. So you can change your relationship with the person who died by changing the image. So in this book, I made my father into a tiny little dragon. Um, and I'll just start with uh, the epigraph of this book. And this is by a Jungian psychologist named Greg Morgeson um, from a book called Greeting the Angels, the, um, an imaginal view of the mourning process. Today, for the first time in human history, the human race collectively is mourning a dying planet. The fate of the Earth depends upon our understanding the dynamics of the mourning process. Though it is tempting to lament the fate of the Earth and blame our forebears for its present state, we must put aside these childish sentiments and take up the adult task of revisioning our ancestral inheritance and educating the dead. O oh, finches of the plastic feeder in your incomparable yellow in the April damp, 
Is there room enough on the porch rail beside you for his tiny feet to clamp like channel axe, to cinch like a workshop grip? The rotting handle rail, greasy with shit. Is there space here to fit his vroom vroom breast, his toy like dragon paws? Claws bared to the epic, the torn shopping bags fan their tails in the branches like paradise's birds in opulent expulsion cast out into nowhere and kinging it. Noahs of the skies, they neither live nor die, but in ever diminishing arcs multiply. Immortality, an ethylene monomer chain, the new world born again and again on the trillion times main of convenience. Oh, finches, shove over. This great heart is assembled yet incomplete. Let his grasping feet clench here. Let his shadow retreat from gravity's rail and spike danger. The anger that entrapped him, unfurling and swirling in the haze. It's a le lethal electrical double with fence, smelted for feeders where minuscule dragons can gobble their fill. And on the shrill get, get, get of the finch's example, sample lift in the consoling dark where the searchlights park having licked their sharp teeth and cut engines and me on the ground here finches wobbling toward the scope with the hope of sighting elfin reptilian wings on the move a thing proven true enough for wanting In the scrim of the slim ribbon of green between the porch and the country byway, an eastern Phoebe bobs its big head to and fro on a spindle thin maple, swallowtail, scattershot, stutters along. Even here, in the slender tea sandwich strata, this slice of spectral coordinates done up in mint, jade, juniper, parakeet, shamrock, emerald, moss, in army and hunter and wiser, in sage, in pine and pear and pickle, in olive and fern and chartreuse, between a loose sort of home and a leaving, between the gar of a car's heated cardiology and the heart that looking listens in, between the F-16 Viper demo crashing in, trashing the da da dum fingerprint th thrum of rain on leaves and the cardinal's bland counterpoint, boxing the teenage woods in the heads with its flow field decimal rock'em sock'em, rat shivering would-be timbers. Between that and the soda can chucked out the window, rattling onto the road's weedy edge, between the chest's fragile thumping and the milk-white air, honeysuckle, almost painfully fragrant dragon crouched down in lane-side scrabble, breathing a little, rubbing his eyes, morning dove oboeing, prelude to vespers, Chuck Will's willow waking up, Abrupt as is the human engine explosion, the get me out of here heave and stroke underneath, inside, embedded within our spatula slap, eat em up appetite for the next and the next and the next place and thing. There's this singing dragon. Do you hear it? Prick up your pointy synesthetic ears. It sounds green as cricket, tree frog, forest, the feel of its ruffly, rapturous paws, the pheromone feast of the minuscule beasts tucked up under its earthy pits. Dragon, this is it. This green is alive. Three, two, four, five, three, four, three, four, three, five, three, four, five, three, five, five, three, five, seven, overwhelmed by its lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, we retreat into our usual Hand tone ways we've numbered heaven on earth and worse we're counting down its days in our habitual split level cartesian haze we can't see the forest for the lumber the president's favorite recipe for the president's slice of the whole condemned pie. Take the cricket out of the bluebird's mouth. Pull the bluebird down from the sky. 
Drain the sky of its cyan and indigo, its sapphire, azure, cobalt, and teal. Steal the owl from the trees, embrace, erase the tree and the forest that hugs it. Tug the reeds from the blackbird's feet. Drain the blackbird's sweet grass swamp. Chomp the brush and flush the snipes. Wipe the soil clean of its blossoms and throw away all the bugs. Pull the rug from under the buzzard's fine breeze. Squeeze the lake dry and evict all the grebes. Plug the yawning holes with sprawl on this leftover tin pot fragment of dirt orbiting a burning hurt. Now you can build your wall. The president speaks. And it's a landfill emission. It's a mega drill fracturing shale. The president speaks. It's an oil well blowout. It's a seismic air gun silencing the whoop whoop music of whales. The president speaks. It's lead ammunition. It's dry cleaner solvent. It's toxic copper filter cake. The president speaks. It's billowing coal dust. It's a train hauling flammable liquids straight through the NIMBY front gate. While the president eats his endangered dinner while he cranks up his jack-in-the-box, let us climb to the top of the president's tower, ride its glittering lift like it's a beautiful woman's cock. We'll take stock of the world from this creaky zenith, plant our bare asses on its ledge, and unlock a whopping view. Pinking clouds and the sun humming its sonorous setting song over a river filling with sandhill cranes. The great wet roost purring like a bed of overfed cats. The marsh awash in wingbeat with the going of geese and the coming of blackbirds by the millions upon millions upon millions. Then Venus, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, the full-bellied moon, and us here, my loves, tits out, lightning bolts dripping, singing our cataclysmic tune, a monsoon of response to the migrating flocks, a pox on the president's particulate matter, the filth at the end of his pen. When dragon uncurls on night's shimmering bed, meteors streaming from his trapezoid head, you know Earth is plowing through deep shit. The president doesn't give a wit. Sandwiched in his mirrored den, the president ad nauseum sees president, president, president. Stockholm syndrome rebranded as an echo chamber for one we're done with this leveling age of improvement, the movement of sound waves from bellowing rockets ripping through rainbows, tearing new assholes out of the sky, flame-throwing lies burning through nations like a megafire on a dry hump jag, California in the bag and popping like microwaved popcorn. It was so loud, said the evacuee, you could hear the trees exploding, pow, pow, pow. We're up here now with the chimney swifts, and like them, we don't need perches. As the president lurches from a vista of the back of his head to a vista of his face, we stand and arch and flip off into space, navigating by sight and scent, by the planet's infasonic rant, by the bloody delicious stars, out above the president's tower, which is made of mud, which lists and leans and lurches, then topples with a thud. And the rest of us left here on earth, let us soften up our edges, go at night and linger there to vibrate in the sedges with a love song of the frogs. For if frogs be with us still, then the woodcock's in the bog, and he's beeping there. He's beeping, not the beeping of relentless human news, but the broadcast of his longing. And he'll rise, and in his slow poke go longing, bump above the tree line, his dumpy body singing where blunt feathers meet air's curve, a high-toned lick, a jingle with no words. Then he'll cut engines, stall himself, and the flopping tumble down, Brave the night like pigtails, hit the ground, stumble to his pink feet, and fluffing beep again. And if she comes then, if she doesn't, 
To us, it's all the same. For the only breadcrumb out of here is the echo that we follow, calling sadness by its name. And in the darkness, spot the outlines of all we've lost and done. Go home and sleep and wake. Take the blinds off all the windows and let the morning come. Well, thanks. Thanks for listening. So let me just uh, remind you to uh, just raise your hand if you have a question. Our producers will come around with note cards and uh, bring to me. And I'll even say, you know, if you want to make a, a comment or an observation, because sometimes those can lead to, to questions also. Uh, Betsy, let me start with the, a question for me. Uh, if you would, can you just sort of talk about what role you see poetry plays, e either in life or in the theme of um, uh, of the conference I in climate? Um, you know, what what can it do? What should it do? What does it not do? What could it do better? Sure. So, um, you know, poetry is something that that people turn to in dark times. There's a famous Bertolt Brecht. Um, uh, aphorism. It goes like this. In the dark times, will there be singing? Yes, there will be singing about the dark times. So poetry witnesses, you know, and it witnesses from a really, from, from, a, from a gut level place. It disrupts the language of politicians and of capital, right? And, and it, it kind of gets to the core hopefully, of human experience. And, you know, we can see that when Trump was elected, there were all of a sudden all these poetry readings on the left. When COVID happened, there was just a ton of poetry being produced. Um, each time we, we go through something kind of intense, you know, I mean, there's, there's a, 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 a very big body of climate change poetry out there um, because it, it, it helps us uh, uh, connect in a universal way to the experience we're having. Uh, this is a, a, a comment that can kind of lead to a discussion, not so much a, a, of a question. It says, sustainability requires equity. How about this idea for a foundation, or at least as a start? $40,000 per year per citizen, based on citizenship, not need. Hey, I'm all for it, man. <laughs> Well, to me, you know, th let me tell you what this says to me, to, just to foster conversation. Um, based on citizenship, not need, but would that money be better suited to go to people who need it more than those that might not need the 40? You know? Yeah. I mean, sure, but we also have to be political about things, right? So, I mean, I, I think that a, a universal... I mean, I think universal income is a great idea. I'm, I'm all for it. Um, Yeah, I'm not sure that uh, I'm not sure that you know. I mean, the the billionaires got really, really rich during COVID. They're even richer. I, I don't know that you know Jeff Bezos needs forty thousand dollars, but I, well, well taken. Let's let Betsy answer. Yeah, well taken. I mean, I don't have much to add to that. Uh, I want to sort of swing back to. Um, your history of, of writing, your travel writing, food writing also. Um, and in your work, I saw a phrase that I'd not seen before. And when I looked at it, I had my own connotation of it. And the phrase was zero waste cooking. Mm -hmm. Now, my own connotation was that to me is every restaurant on a Monday. <laughs> you know, what, do, what do we have left? That's today's soup. You know, but yeah, could you, you, think, you could you, you kind of talk about that phrase? Sure. I mean, yeah, if restaurants are doing that, that's great. And um, actually, uh, there is a, the, you know, there's a restaurant in town that's some restaurant tour told me that they're doing that. 
yesterday. Um, but, you know, that's not what fine dining is like. And I'm oftentimes reporting on fine dining. So fine dining is, you know, uh, you know, caviar and Wagyu beef and foie gras and strawberries in winter. And that's what we need to change. So um, the story, the, the recent story on no waste cooking that is in um, the April issue of Travel and Leisure is about fine dining in Stockholm and how Stockholm restaurants are using all sorts of techniques in the kitchen to um, you know, cook the whole animal, cook the whole plant, because we throw out a lot of plant matter, um, and, uh, and preserve them you know, preserve local ingredients through the winter months um, so that they, you know, don't, so that they're not actually uh, flying strawberries halfway around the world. So you're eating, you know, pickled, pickled elderberries instead. Uh, there's also vertical farming um, there in, in Stockholm. Um, but I will say that, you know, air travel is one thing, and that's a big carbon footprint. I flew here, right? But uh, food waste is even bigger carbon footprint and we should all be thinking about it and most of that waste is household waste actually not restaurant waste so you know there are things you can do learn to do you know cook the whole thing and use your food scraps um, there are a number of books out there now that are about that um, compost you know don't throw away your food scraps because all of those end up in landfills and that methane gas is deadly for the environment we have a great compost program here in Boulder, curbside even. Let me come back to poetry with a, a question from our audience. Every line of your poetry is so packed with color, texture, and rich vocabulary. I felt the same way. It makes me wonder, what is your process of collecting images is? In short, would you be willing to share about your writing process, which you touched on before? Yeah, well, I have a drawer full of clippings from <laughs> from newspapers and magazines actually I you know now I mean now I mainly do it digitally but uh, you know I once went on a writing residency and I had an entire suitcase full of newspaper clippings and they stopped me um, the TSA stopped me because they were like you know this is weird you know <laughs> I was like yeah I'm a writer and I uh, but so I do a lot, a lot of research. Um, the news is always a big part of it. History is a big part of it. The Oxford English Dictionary is a big part of my process. I'm looking at the at the um, the history um, of words. Um, the etymology of words uh, is always uh, illuminating and fascinating to me. Um, mythology plays into my um, po in my poetry a lot. Uh, folklore. Um, so everything, everything actually is fair game. Something you might say to me, say to me like off the cuff. There's a line at the beginning of New Jersey. It's an enormous moment and a tiny thing. Well, that's straight from Sarah Jessica Parker about the last, see, the last show of you know, Sex in the City. It just worked for me. Um, so I, I really am, um, it, you know, there, there's there's a term called palimpsest, and that's say say you know you see a. a uh, you probably see this on campus. There's like a poster, and then somebody's posted it over with another poster, right? And then they posted it over with another poster, and maybe it's gotten ripped in the rain, and you see different pieces of that poster, right? That's palimpsest, right? And the, the uh, adjective would be palimpsestial. My poetry feels like that to me. Um, it's collages, it's palimpsestial, and then it's filled with my, my own musings and my own experiences. And so I get a big stack of notes hundreds of pages and then I just start squeezing and squeezing and squeezing and condensing and condensing and trying to get the most amount of energy out of them and what drives me though is sound something you probably understand Ron because Ron's a music DJ right um, so I hear it and it's a driving beat and it has a lot of rhyme in it um, so it feels like song while I'm writing. I have uh, two questions that, to me, kind of go hand in hand and in order. So I'll ask one and then the other as sort of a follow-up. How do you gain, and this is a question I think we all can relate to. How do you gain confidence in sharing your art? Uh-huh. Yeah, practice. Practice. Uh, 
So um, I just kind of threw myself into it. I started in the slam poetry scene, just getting on stage. And that was really important to me because I want to connect to audiences when I'm up here. Um, not every poet feels that way. And many, many poets are shy and they're very much on the page. And, uh, but for me, it's really important to perform. So the more you do it, the more comfortable you get with it. Um, when I was younger, I, you know, although I sang in choirs as a kid, I never would have just gotten up here and just belted out a song to you. But you know, the other thing that happened was I got middle age, you know, and you kind of give up, you, you just kind of give up like your embarrassment over stuff you know I mean it's like oh well okay I got some wrinkles oh, I just can't care anymore you know I you know I'm, I'm gonna sing I'm gonna sing today I'm gonna sing my middle-aged woman heart out for you um so so really it's just time it's just time and I and if you're a poet if you're a student here and you're a poet I would encourage you to just share so you can keep sharing and I just want to point out that uh, plans originally were for the two of us to sit up here. But it was Betsy's idea of, no, 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 I want to come down. I want to have a podium. I want to stand when I read my poetry. And there's a certain confidence. Could you see, have seen yourself requesting this 20 years ago? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's about performance, right? Look, I am sh I'm, a, I'm shy one-on-one, -on -one, but I'm a Leo, so I'm really okay with a big crowd. <laughs> uh, the second question is, how do you get your poetry published? Mm -hmm. This is an excellent question. So, um, if this, is this a student question? It is. Okay. Very good. <laughs> is there a journal on campus? Okay, so that's a good place to start. And if you're really into poetry, get involved with a journal. You know, become an editor there or get involved in some way. Um, submit your poetry there. That's a great, great, great place, right? That's kind of how I started as a writer because I was an editor on an alternative campus uh, newspaper in college. Um, and then there are lots and lots and lots of opportunities for publishing out there. And I'll tell you where to find them poetsandwriters.org so it's pw.org online and that's filled with uh with with um you know information on where to submit your writing how to get published where to go to readings you know what reading venues you know you might be able to put together a reading for the other thing i would say you are on campus with a big audience of people organize a reading you know, you've got the facilities, you've got the, you know, the AV, like, you know, go for it. That was another thing that, you know, we did in, in when I was in college is we organized, you know, art nights and people would perform. Um, so you don't have to wait for somebody to put your work out there. You can put it out there. The other thing that people are doing nowadays is putting their work out on TikTok and on Instagram. Um, you know, that's not exactly, you know, for me that generationally, I, I'm not, I'm not reading my work on TikTok, but lots of people are, and it gets a lot of attention, right? I mean, you know, books are sold on TikTok, you know, books are sold on Instagram and, and, and poetry is shared that way. So Facebook, there's also a lot of poetry groups on Facebook where you can post your poetry, um, easy to find them. Uh, yeah, I, I think that it's no better time to actually put your work out there because there are many places to do it. I want to go back to the process, and this is sort of a, a two-part question. What comes first in your poetry? Does researching your points interrupt the flow? Do you research first, outline before you start writing? Yeah, I research first. Also, I should add science. I have a lot of science in my work because it feels like magic and sometimes black magic, sometimes dark magic, and sometimes, you know, I don't know, colorful magic. Um, so, yeah, I get a big, big stack of, uh, of notes that I've taken, uh, p bits of language that I have, um, that I've, I've scarfed from various places. I 
carry this around and I'm, I'm always adding to my notes in this in this phone and then every so often I'll dump it into a, a, a big word doc um, and then I print all that out before I start writing. I do almost all of my poetry writing on residency at artists' residencies um, because I'm a journalist and I'm very, very busy otherwise. And so I need to disrupt my normal day to day to get my art, to really get my art done, to have that amount of focus. You know, so it is a great gift to me that I get to go for two or three or weeks or a month to an artist's residency and they feed me and house me and give me a studio and all I am expected to do all day long is work on my poetry. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Um, uh, so I have all these notes and then I start looking at them and I don't do a lot of revision. I write page to page, even though these are book length poems, I think of each page as complete in and of itself. Um, sometimes I think to myself, uh, you know, while I'm on residency, I'm always reading too. I've got a bunch of books that are relative, relative, relative to my topic. So I'm always sort of adding in extra stuff as I'm going. Uh, I want to kind of come back to the process a little bit that for people who are not familiar with your work um, There it is it it doesn't look like a poem Those of us that might think of a poem as something it looks like a jigsaw puzzle piece You know a couple of words a couple of words a couple of words But yours is more like prose writing if you look at it on the page It's you fill the page Yeah, how, how, how does how did you get to that part where that's your poetry? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So it's it's still in lines, you know, and I think about the line. So, um, you know, the line is, in, is important because it in itself is also, and poetry is also just, you know, it's, it's an entity. It's in and, in and of itself. So the page, the page is complete in and of itself. The line is complete in and of itself. So I write line to line. Right, and I think about where I am turning that line. Where am I starting the next line? Um, my lines have gotten longer and longer because I want to pack a lot into each one of them. If you look at the three books, actually, the lines are shorter, a little shorter in New Jersey, and they're so long and crowded that the font is really small. Um, and so I'm thinking, actually, the next book I'm going to go back to a, a shorter line. And maybe a little more quiet. I don't know. You say the question here. Could you say that again? What yeah. poets have influenced Thanks for you? asking that. So um, I went to graduate school. In, I went to in an MFA program at George Mason University. At the, at the time, it was the only place I wanted to go because there was a poet there named Carolyn Forche. So Carolyn Forche is, I think, our great American poet of the world. Um, she is. She was a journalist in El Salvador during during the war there, um, and wrote a memoir about that um, a few years ago, which is an incredible book. And um, she, you know, has family from Eastern Europe, um, and has written a lot about the Holocaust, um, and has written about. Uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, she is someone who has traveled around the world and been very involved in, um, in, in a movement of poetry that witnesses to the devastations. Um, and I think more than any other American poet, she's out there. So she's very, very important to me and, and, and a close friend. And I would encourage you to read her work, Carolyn Forche. Um, there is a book called The Angel of History that is absolutely, incredibly exquisite. Um, Walt Whitman, you know, great poet of, of New York, lived in Brooklyn, you know, abolitionist, gay, you know, uh, uh, just a, a, a great uh, lover of life. Um, uh, Muriel Ruckheiser, 
a lesbian poet, mid-century um, America. Um, she was a uh, radical leftist um, and wrote really beautiful poetry about, there's a poem of hers called Despisals. And she writes about the backsides of the building, buildings and the useful like shit, you know, just like all that stuff that we like to ignore, but actually tells us a lot about ourselves and about the world that we've built, you know, the backsides of the buildings. Um, so I would encourage you to look at that poem, Despisals. Also, um, even more important is um, a poem of hers called Waking This Morning. And it starts off something like, you know, waking this morning, a violent woman, you know, uh, in the violent morning, you know, sort of facing the day, you know, and, and her acceptance of the fact that, you know, this stuff is not external to us. It is inside us, right? We have the light and dark in us, right? And our job is to sort of integrate those and figure out a way to live, right? To mourn the, 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 the bad stuff and look towards the light and figure out a way to go on. So, um, yeah, that's another really important poem to me waking this morning. Uh, I just want to step away from poetry for a second and, and come back to the theme while we still have time, the theme of the conference this year. Uh, you mentioned how you have been a scuba diver for decades yeah. and you've seen the change. Could you talk about what you have seen uh, under the ocean in the past 40 years? Yeah, and I will. Yep. What I'd you also know just, about that? Sure, I'd also just li like to mention Audre Lorde. Everyone should read Audre Lorde, the poet Audre Lorde. Um, yeah, so I started diving when I was uh, 14 um, in Hawaii, and uh, there was a lot down there. And there was a healthy reef. It was really colorful. Uh, there were a lot of fish. I have dove um, in recent years in places where uh, there's nothing, you know? The reef is dead. Um, much of that, uh, like say, uh, there are parts of Key West. The, I went diving in Key West. There was nothing down there. That was from cruise ship traffic killing the reef. You know, just <laughs> destroying the reef. Um, it is also, also from bleaching from acidifying oceans. Um, I had a really nice opportunity in Bonaire to be involved in reef restoration. Um, so they take, you know, Bonaire has a fairly healthy reef, it's all national park. Um, and they take little bits of uh, baby coral and they hang them on these PVC trees and it grows. And so I, but it needs to be cleaned and of, of algae, which will kill it. So I went down there and, and helped do that. Other scuba divers, um, you know, clean, clean trash from the oceans. Um, there's some hope. Um, uh, there's some corals that have been found to be resilient to warming and acidifying seas. And also, there was just, you know, the United States did not, uh, was not part of this agreement, but there was a big agreement. Uh, um, over 100 nations agreed to set aside a third of the, um, of, of the plant, basically, for bio, biodiversity. And, there, and part of that was a really big ocean treaty to set aside a third of the oceans on Earth for, um, for, for, marine, um, for marine reserves. And I have dove in marine reserves, and I know, I also know from the science, that marine reserves, if you set aside a piece of the ocean where there is no fishing allowed, and there is, you know, there are no big ships allowed, and there's no sonic booms, you know, from oil exploration and from from the navy testing their, you know, submarines. You get diversity; it comes back. The ocean really heals itself that way, um, and it's so that's really important. At this point, we we only have a fraction of the of the ocean that is set aside, but there's a big portion in this new treaty. We'll see what happens with it, but it's hopeful. There's intention behind it. Um, yeah. Would you just hold up the bottom uh, to show people? I just want to point out that this book is available at the uh, book table right outside here that the Boulder Bookstore has set up, so you, you can uh, read more about it. Yeah, and I, I would say, I, I, you know, please buy the book and I, I will sign it for you. I also brought copies of Crowded because if I put them on the table there, they would charge you more. But I will give you the author discount, $10 a book. So they're here, come talk to me, buy a book, and I'll sign it for you. 
That's our program for this morning. Let's say thank you very much to Betsy Andrews for joining us for her first time, hopefully not last, at the Conference Excellent. on World Affairs. And thank you all for being here, too. Thank you. Continuing education knows that at the end, students want to graduate, and we can help them do that because we take the time to really listen to their needs, and we understand all the different options that are available across the campus for them. We don't take a cookie cutter approach. We realize each student comes with their own story. So whether it's a part-time student looking to complete a degree program or someone just looking for online courses, we're there to connect them to the resources of the university.